as far as collecting data. Even collecting data in the triage mode that CAPE is, is uh, specialized in, it is just considerably faster. Um, it has both a GUI and a command line interface. Today, we're going to talk about the command line version um, because that lends itself to being configurable and scriptable. Um, CAPE also has a batch mode. And you know, you think if we're scripting it, a batch mode seems pretty normal to have. Uh, but it also has the ability in that batch mode to initiate a certain set of commands automatically. And we'll see how that makes launching a, a series of commands <clears throat> um, over a remote connection much simpler. Cape can deal with locked files. So when we talk about things like registry files, um, other system files, perhaps um, an EDB database, those types of things it can easily handle volume shadow copies um, you know at first we all knew about volume shadow copies but we didn't really know how to process them and then we got to the point where we knew about volume shadow copies but it was awkward to process them or difficult to process them now with cape it's just a matter of adding one command line switch and we have access to all that volume shadow copy data another thing that makes cape different uh, from other triage tools is that it can also process the data that it collected. Well, and not only just the data it collected, you can also point it at data that was collected by other tools at a different time. The output of um, CAPE, both the data that it's collected and the processed output from the tools um, are, can be placed in a VHDX container. So it's much easier to handle uh, when you think about which you have to do with an EO1 as an example, a forensic image. Um, we have a lot of great tools like Arsenal that make it very easy to mount, but to, to um, mount a VHDX, all we have to do is double click on it. It becomes a drive letter and you just treat it like any other normal drive um, on your Windows system. And then lastly, um, it's just Eric's responsiveness. Um, his responsiveness to feedback mostly in the form of hey could you make it do this you know feature um, requests and enhancements and in his ability to helping people understand how to use the tool or if there truly is a bug fixing it immediately so response from eric and i don't want to you know pay him into a corner here but is usually in a day or less um, and the problems are usually fixed in that same time frame if there happen to be any all right so what does cape do Really, CAPE does just three things. Um, it searches for data, it collects that data, and it processes that data. So by searching, we mean that it can search any Windows file system. So as an example, I can search a mounted EO1, but not the EO1 itself. So the way I like to explain that is, if I can look at it with Windows Explorer, then I can look at it with CAPE. I can search it with CAPE. Um, we can also do the same thing with volume shadow copies, which is, you know, something that was not easily done before. And when we actually, so we build this list, that's what the searching is, I build a list of the things that I want to collect. Of course, the collection is forensically sound, that goes without saying. Um, it provides a detailed copy log of what was collected. Uh, it also has a separate file of what was um, not collected or, or skipped. So we also have the ability to transfer this data to different locations. So we can you know, send it to an, FT, an SFTP server. We can send it to you know, an Amazon uh, S3 location in the cloud, as well as Azure. Uh, one of the things that didn't make it on there, which we'll talk about in a moment, is we can also send it to a UNC PAC, um, as well as you know, a USB drive. So the last part, processing, is the part that a lot of other tools cannot do. So we, we've collected data, and now we want to run some type of utility against that data. Reason being is by the time that data makes it back to your lab or to the analyst, not only do I have the collected artifacts that I need to do the analysis on this case, I already have a good set of reports in which to work. So I'm not wasting my own time back in the lab generating these reports, by the time it gets to me, they're already there. Now, this, the you know other major benefit of this is that 
because everybody is running off of the same configuration file, all the machines are collected exactly the same. So it's, it's you know, it's easy to um, institute this consistent and repeatable process. So targets and modules. Um, CAPE has two concepts, right? It's, it's you're either you're collecting targets or you're processing modules. Okay. So targets are really just files and folders. Right? That's 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 all it is. I'm going to go collect files and folders. And certain types of files, like registry files, are still files on the file system, so I can collect them. They may be locked. Kate may have to go through a special method to collect those, but they can still be collected. So modules um, process those files. So as an example that we'll look at today, uh, kind of running throughout the, the demos, is we're going to go out and collect link files and jump lists from a series of systems. So I've collected that data. I packaged it up however I wanted to, you know, a VHDX um, or you know, just, just the file structure uncompressed. Now I can go run whatever tools I want to run against that. So I could run Eric's commands, you know, um, LECMD as an example for link files. I could run um, TZ works against it. And for that matter, um, any other third party tool that lends itself to, to being scripted can be used as a module. So another good example would be sysinternals. So when we say these um, operations can be done independently of each other, what we're saying is I can do just a collection or I can do just the processing or I can do them both. So I could do processing on data that's been collected somewhere else or I could do processing on data on a live system without actually collecting the artifacts. I just want the reports. So those types of things can all be done. So we talked about the two main driving factors or what control Kate are these configuration files. So target configs basically define what are we gonna collect? Um, and that's it. I mean, we, we, can, we can look at those as things that are very granular or things that are very broad. Um, we try to make those typically granular. Um, because then I can mix and match them as I wish. Meaning that a config file can be a compound config file in that a config can call another config. Um, these are all, you can create your own, um, you know, highly customizable. But the good thing is, is that there is a core set of targets and modules already defined and already available when Cape ships to you. Um, if you find the need to alter those or to create a new one from scratch, you have the ability to do that. So modules work in a similar way, but the difference is, is that it's running a script or it's running an executable, but a module can only run one of those at a time. So if I'm running LECMD as an example, that's all that module can do. But as we talked about earlier, I can run multiple modules on the command line or I can create another module that happens to call multiple modules. So another, comp another compound module. So actually looking at those config files, they're very simple, um, they're Yara. Um, so the reason I point that out is indentation um, does make a difference and special characters like tabs make a difference. Um, if you look at your file and say, hey, it looks perfect, I don't know what's wrong. Look for those hidden characters, look for indentation. Um, in this particular file on the right, on the left hand side, we have con target configs. And basically what this is telling us is that um, the very first thing that I have highlighted is do I want to re um, rebuild the directory structure? So meaning if I have, um, if I'm collecting the main system files, I want it to be in Windows system 32 config, not just all lumped into one directory. This is the default. This is what you'll almost always use. So going on down the file, basically I'm saying, I wanna collect AMCache, here's where it lives. I can certainly support um, wildcards. And you'll see on the very bottom of this one, you'll see the, on the end of the log file, you're, you're using a, a wildcard there. If we move over to the module configs, um, it works in a very similar way. The highlighted area with the green arrow pointing to it, what I wanna point out here is that um, 
modules will group their output according to categories. So when I look at the output of modules, there'll be a higher level folder that tells me all of the program execution reports or output will be inside this folder. Um, <clears throat> the other piece that, that is interesting is that you'll see the URL um, to the actual file itself uh, so that when Kate goes to refresh itself, it knows where to pull the latest version of that executable. And at the bottom, basically this is, here's the executable you're going to run, and here's the command line that you're gonna to pass to it, okay? So these are just examples. I'm, I'm going through this to basically level set. So when we move into talking about how we're gonna use this at scale, we're all kind of on the same playing field. So we'll move through this. I'm trying to move this through this quickly, um, but I think we, we wanna get this level uh, playing field set. So looking at command lines for the targets, it's really pretty simple. Uh, you, you need to tell it just a few things. You need to tell it the source, where am I pulling the data from, the target, and what the target means is what, um, what, what is the name of the target config file that is going to tell me, going to define what I want to collect. So in this case, it's evidence of execution, and that's a compound target, meaning it is a um, it points to several other targets. So evidence execution, I am grabbing prefetch, um, amcache, syscache, et cetera. Uh, next slide down, tflush just means I'm going to delete any previous data in this output folder before I write any new data to it. The destination, the tdest, tells me where I'm gonna write the files. And the last one, the tag tag um, vhdx tells me I want to put all of this collected data in a VHDX file. And the option that comes after that is, what is the prefix you want to use for that file? So in this particular case, we're using a PowerShell envir environment variable that will put the computer name in that file name. Another thing about VHDX is, is that by default, they're also compressed. So you get the, the, the VHDX, which is already compressed, and then on top of that, it is zipped up. Um, we've noticed that there's a considerable amount of additional compression that we can get by doing that zip. So when you look at your output, you're gonna see a zip file thinking, well, I thought I said VHDX. So you have to unzip that file to get to the VHDX. And I'll show you that when we get to the demo. So modules, very similar. Um, basically, we, we give it a source. And typically, but it doesn't have to be, the source is going to be the destination from the target. So, right, I collected some data and I want to do an operation on it. So, the destination from the source is often the, um, the source for the module. In this particular case, we're, all, we're running um, two different modules. We're running P, um, PEC CMD, which is prefetch, and we're running the AMCache parser. Because remember, our target was collecting evidence of execution. So these are two tools, two programs that I can run against that data. Once again, we're gonna flush the data before we write anything new to it, and I give it a destination folder. And on the side, all, all I'm showing you on the side is here's what those two um, modules look like, the PE, CMD, and the AMCache parser. All right, so destination options. So we, we talked about, we, we give it a destination, and earlier I was listing a few things that we could write to. So why do we care about where we're writing it to? Well, one is, you know, we're trying to preserve evidence and I don't want to write it somewhere where it could get tainted. So I want to get it to a secure, excuse me, a secure location as soon as possible. And in addition to that, I want to get it into the hands of my analysts as soon as possible. So writing it to the local hard drive probably isn't the best bet, but there are times where that may be your, your only option. So where can CAPE write that data? It can write it to the local hard drive, which I just said is probably not your best option, but you may have to. You can write it to a USB thumb drive or you know, removable drive. You can write it to a UNC path. You can write it to an SFTP server. And you'll see in a second that CAPE itself can be that SFTP server. 
It can write it to S3 and it can write it to Azure. And we'll go through examples of all this and, and, and how these things work. Because this is where we start to get into, all right, how am I going to use this at scale? You know, getting it off premise, sending this data to um, a server off premise, sending it to the cloud. Now we're talking about things that are, you know, enabling that at scale part of this talk. Whereas I'm just going in and I'm collecting a handful of machines and I walk in and I load thumb drives into it and do my collection via that thumb drive. So UNC paths, um, there's really three different kind of things that we could do with or utilize UNC paths for. Um, we can collect from them. You know, this may be in a, you know, kind of host-based um, investigation. This may not make a lot of sense. Let's say, you know, on a, on a corporate level or especially on an e-discovery um, level, this may make a lot of sense. So we can, not only can we write data to it, we can collect from it. Okay, and the only, the only caveat here is that whatever machine or machines that are executing CAPE obviously need to have access to these shares. Now, we can write to it. We've already talked about this previously. It's just This is the output. I'm moving this data um, off to a, you know, a separate source. Now, the thing to understand about USB and UNC Pass is it has an additional benefit of the files are only written to those devices. There's no intermediate writing of the files to the target system before they're shipped off anywhere else. We'll talk about that more in a second. And this is the one that it really has a lot of benefit to being able to minimize the footprint that we have on those remote systems. So not only can I read and write from a UNC path, I can launch CAPE from a UNC path. So I don't have to copy the CAPE executables onto your target drive. I can run it from that UNC path. Now that makes a lot of sense when you think about it from a USB thumb drive. It's like, well, you know, of course I'll do that. But when you're running it in this larger environment, you know, how do you make the executable available to the program to run it? This is one of the ways you could do that. So um, SFTP, so another way that we would move this data is to an SFTP server. Maybe it's inside the network, maybe it's outside. Um, really doesn't matter. And we will do, um, <clears throat> excuse me. Uh, so uh, we will, sorry. Um, we'll define what the, you know, exactly the same line that we've done before. What are my targets? Uh, in this particular example, I'm showing registry, hive, uh, registry hives and link files and jump lists and evidence of execution. So three different types of artifacts that we're collecting. And where we're going to send it temporarily is to this folder called temp t out. Um, we're also going to include the, um, well, it should say tac tac. There should be two dashes in front of BSSS. And that tells us I want to also process the volume shadow copies. And it should be tac tac TDD, which means do duplicate these things. And by default, if I'm telling it I want volume shadow copies or telling Cape I want volume shadow copies, it will deduplicate it. So if you don't want the deduplication for some reason, you have to tell it that you don't want it. And then finally, I want all that data that I'm collecting zipped up and put into the HDX. And I'm going to use the computer name as that prefix to the VHDX. Now, this is the new part. So I have to give it the information to get to and log into that SFTP server. So I give it a name or an IP, give it the port, 22 is the default, you could leave 22 off. Um, <clears throat> so you give it SCU, which is the username, and you give it the password. And with that information, CAPE will connect to that server and move all the data that you just collected in whatever form it's in, this one's in VHDX, over to that server. So I said a second ago that CAPE can also be um, the server itself. So CAPE has the ability to run in SFTP um, server mode. And the way we do that is we, the first thing is we have to have, tell it what configuration we want to use. And that would, in the kind of salmon color block, I'm telling you that basically here's the home directory I want you to set up. And this is where the files are going to be stored. 
and underneath that root, there'll be a folder for each user. I can define multiple users with for this FTP server. So meaning maybe I'm collecting you know, different machines with different users and I wanna store that data in different locations, I have the ability to do that. I then say who the username is, its credentials, um, meaning both its password and what it's allowed to do. And that's it. So in the blue box, the command to initiate CAPE in an SFTP server is basically that uh, option, as well as the name of the file that we just talked about. <clears throat> so when we initiate that command, what we're gonna see is basically it is um, the server starting up and the key part that's gonna show us is here's the IP address of this server. And here are those arguments that I need to provide to uh, the command line. So it tells me exactly how I need to set that command line up. So let's take a second and look at that. All right. So basically, let me explain a little bit about the environment you're looking at. So um, to emphasize the, the speed, is I want you to understand these things are gonna run, these commands are gonna run very quickly. But realize that I've got four VMs running on a MacBook Pro to support this environment. So, you know, not a lot of horsepower going into this. So take that into consideration when you see the execution times. You can kind of multiply that out by uh, the horsepower you're applying it to. It's not uncommon to see CAPE, uh, both a combination of targets and modules run in a very few seconds, sometimes you know under one second. It's, it's just amazing. All right, so um, let's see, I'm gonna set it up on here. Okay, so I just have a PowerShell window. Let me make this bigger for you guys. All right. So I'm just recalling the command that I've typed during my testing and set up for this. So basically, I'm gonna execute CAPE and I'm gonna give it the, pro the um, option of SFTP, SFTPC, and then the name of the config file that I wanna run. And this is the same config file that I showed you on the slides. So executing this command, that quickly, I've set up that server. Okay. And here's the information. So when I look at these commands, I know that this is my IP. And these are the other parameters that I need to provide on that command line to make the connection to this FTP, SFTP server. So this guy will sit there and wait for connections. As connections happen, we'll be able to see that on the screen. And as we look at other demos, you'll actually see um, that activity happening on the screen. And that way, you know, we know something's happening, especially during testing. It's very helpful to understand that your command um, is running because you may have gone through several machines to get here. And how do you actually tell if it's running. So I found this very helpful when I was doing my testing. So let's move from SFTP to other types of storage. So we said that um, we could also send data to both Amazon and to Azure. So what you're looking at with some, you know, some of the key components grayed out is what a command line looks like to send it to um, AWS. And the key part, well, I can't, I'll show you when we actually run this, is that you're providing it some variables such as, um, you know, what region is it in, what's your bucket name, uh, what's your key, those types of things. So this works just as simply as a UNC path, as, um, sending it to an S SFTP server. You're starting to see these pieces starting to fall in place now. Okay, well, if I can take my data that I've collected off all these inter these uh, systems in the enterprise and ship them off premise, now, now I can get my analysts working on that data right away because they can access it from some other part of the world. I can do the same thing with Azure. It's a different command line structure. Um, but accomplishes the same thing. And so in the demo, I'll show you, you know, basically how this all works and, where, and actually show it happening. 
So why don't we do that? So we're going to come to this particular machine and let's see. I need to make a bigger disk so I can see. There we go. Okay, so the first one we'll do um, is basically we're going to take a step back just for a second, and I'll show you how UNC works, and then we'll move into um, AWS and Azure. So I have a few scripts that first we'll take a look at them so that you can see what's in them, and then we'll run them. Okay, so in this particular command, we're talking about the, the top part up here. So um, we're going to write it to this particular um, UNC path, lab4, um, C$ dollar sign, cape out destination. All right, and we're going to name it with that particular environment variable. Okay, so when CAPE runs, it's going to throw up this window and tell it and show us the activity. And, the, and of course, that seems very normal, and, and the window goes away when, it, when it's finished. The only reason I point that out is that we do have an option to tell CAPE to leave that window open. So when running a single command, it may not make that much sense. But if we're using a batch file and we're running a lot of different commands at one time, we may want to review each one of those individual windows to see what the messages are. And if they're just closing as fast as they're running, we don't really get an opportunity to do that. So when we talk about more batch files, um, we'll, we'll show you exactly what I'm talking about by the, by the GUI parameter. So that was UNC pass so to review. Basically I said, I am going to run the tool from here Okay, so I said, CAPE resides at this particular UNC path. I want to write my data to that UNC path. Okay. Now we'll move on to looking at um, AWS. So looking at this command, maybe it'll make it a little bigger for you. Very similar looking structure. We're calling Cape. We're giving it um, a source, telling it what the targets are. Uh, we give it a destination. Once again, this is a temporary destination. So that this data can be packaged up and then sent on to um, the ultimate destination at um, AWS. So all of these keys, um, basically there's a little bit of documentation um, here and in the manual on how to create them, but the documentation is more on the AWS side or the Azure side on how to create these particular keys or, or gather the particular parameters that are used in making this connection.
So you can see that all three of those commands ran extremely quickly on a very overloaded laptop PC. Um, now you may be asking, well, oh, that's all great, Mark. We, we saw you run a couple of commands, but did that data actually get there? And yes, indeed it did. So if we go back and let's see for Azure, I can use the Azure um, Explorer and look at the look at that data that was just transferred. Sometimes it takes a minute to make it there. Well, let's bounce over and try to look at um, the S3 data. Okay, so what we see here is that here is the folder that I'm pushing the data into. And here's the log that accompanies all of these collections. So we talked earlier about the fact that there's a console log that tells us exactly what happened. And then here's the zip file that contains the VHDX that contains all the data, basically the, um, the zipped up target data, the, the data that we're collecting, as well as the module output. So that's on Amazon. Let's see if they decided to show us the data on Azure. No, I'm not sure what the delay is there. Usually it's instantaneous. Okay, well, if you will take me, take my word for that, it does get to uh, does get to Azure just like it did to Amazon. Okay, so now we've seen that we've got a lot of different ways that we can actually get the data off premise. And I mentioned batch mode before. So batch mode is basically driven by a special file that lives in the, um, the same directory from which cape is executed, named underscore cape.cli. Um, if this folder is in that directory, when cape initiates, it's first thing it does is look for that folder. So no matter what commands or you know parameters you put on your cape command, they'll be ignored and it's going to run whatever is in this bash file. Um, so the other thing that happens, and this we'll, we'll show you this in just a sec, is that for each each line in the uh, bash file, cape is going to spawn a separate process. Okay, and what you'll see is many many windows opening at once. Now this may be desirable or it may not. And the reason is it depends upon how you've configured your batch file. As an example, if I had one command in there that said, go collect data, and another command that said, process that data, well, how, you know, has the data been collected before the processing begins? Um, in most cases, probably not because it spawns them so quickly. So we have the ability to put in um, an option that says, run these commands in sequence, okay? Basically process them linearly. Linear it, right? um, and that's the dash ul option. Uh, now, once it completes its run, that cape underscore dot cli, CLI file will be renamed. So that basically tells cape, hey, this one's already been run, and don't attempt to run it again. Now, so if we want to process you know, another batch with that same file, we either have to create a new file, meaning just you know copy it from someplace. Um, or, well, we have to get that file in there. So one of the things I wanna show you is, if I run one command with a batch file and arguments, it's gonna run and it's gonna use the batch file. If I immediately run that command again, 
it's going to run what's on the command line because that they, that underscore Kate that CLI has been um, has been renamed. So. Here's the other option I was talking about is that so these these other important options in the batch file are um, CU, which means cleanup, and dash GUI. And dash GUI is the one I told you about a moment ago, which controls whether the screens pop up and stay there until you press another key or they go away once that process has completed. So here's what those batch files look like. Um, very simple. Once again, one line per um, one command per line. And the very top line in this file here is a collection, right? So we're, we're actually, it's a target and we're gonna collect data. Now I'm showing this as an example of something you might not wanna do to, to point the problem out. So the next group of lines are all modules that we want to use to process this data. So this target called basic collection is a whole string of targets Meaning it's really, it's an entire triage collection, not just one or two um, artifacts. But if I immediately roll into starting to process that, there's not gonna be any data for it to process. So the one thing that would need to be added to this particular line is the tag tag um, UL, which means process these one at a time, okay? Um, so step one is Cape runs. If this file exists, run this file, forget about any arguments on the command line, and then rename um, rename that, that CLL file. So let's see if we can look at a demo on that. There we go. So what I'm looking for is I have pre-configured um, a bunch of batch files that I need to rename one of these as um, to drop the last extension. It just needs to be cape.cli. So if we just copy. So I'm copying the one that I want to demo, the, the dot batch to my CLI. Now I have a dot CLI in that particular folder. So that's going to be the one that will execute. And if I look at that one, here's what we've got. Nope. So now, now that I've gotten that all straightened out, basically 
what I'm going to do is just execute CAPE. And CAPE's going to see that that particular batch file is already there. Now, let's see something. I'm going to run a command like this just to illustrate the point that I can just run it to there. Even though I'm providing command line options, that's not what's going to run. What ran was the batch file that I just renamed to .cli. So now you can see the fact that CAPE spawn all of those processes that quickly. And that dash GUI option allows these screens um, to, to run until we hit a key. And I can see that um, it didn't run because there was no data to process. And what, what didn't process was this. I wanted to show that I've already collected data previously. So here's my target data. Sorry, a little bit. So what was going to happen here is that I basically had data that I'd previously collected. It was in a VHDX. It was going to mount that VHDX um, and then run this particular script against it. But what I really wanted to point out was the fact that so CAPE is going to run and process that batch file, even though I gave it parameters. Now, if we do it again, same command. Now it's actually collecting data. And the reason is, is that it was processing that command line's arguments now. Previously, it didn't do that. It processed the batch file. That's why all the windows popped up. So it, it, the point I'm trying to illustrate is, one, all those windows pop up if you give it the GUI argument, and you can review each window um, to see its status. And secondly, is that if you provide arguments, and that batch file is there, it will run. So the batch file is kind of a double-edged sword. It can be very effective in that it allows you to just run, just run the Kate command and not worry about what the arguments are. And let me give you an example where that might be very effective. You have a need to collect data from a bunch of different systems that you don't have remote access to for, for whatever reason. You can provide <clears throat> basically the tools to an IT person um, at that location and basically tell them all you have to do is type in the word CAPE and this will run. It will collect all the data that I have defined that I want collected and you just turn around and ship me back that USB thumb drive. So that automation is great. The other, edge is, the other side of that sword is the fact that if it exists in that folder and you're not aware of it, you're not collecting the data you thought you were. All right, wow, we're really running short of time. So um, basically, how are we tying this together for the um, the automation part of this, the PowerShell? How are we gonna do this at scale? Um, PowerShell is probably one of the best tools that we can use to do this. Um, the reason is, is that it can uh, execute commands asynchronously, meaning all at the same time, versus going through a loop or doing them one at a time. Um, so basically what I mean by that is that, so if I was even in PowerShell and I was doing a, you know, some type of for loop to go through this, although it may go through that loop extremely quickly, um, <clears throat> it still is looping and doing one at a time. It, so it's something like this. Okay. Now what we mean by asynchronously is I can do this. So now I'm sitting here waiting, I initiate my command and boom. In a fan out motion, it sends out all those commands. So to enable PS remoting, basically there's a, there's a few sets of things or a few commands that you wanna do. Um, first, you wanna check your network profiles. And by the way, all of this information, um, all these commands that I'm showing you uh, will be available on a GitHub page that has been set up specifically for this. Um, in the next day or so, I'll post all this code uh, to that GitHub page. Um, 
So what, what I've shown you before is, oper is um, initiating all of these commands from the command line. So what we really need to be able to do is, is to issue these commands from some type of control system that will reach out to all the, all the systems that we've provided to do this type of CAPE imaging. So one of, the, one of the things that we talked about earlier is that we really don't want to write any data to a target system unless we have to. So one of the things that we can do um, is, one of the things we could do in this remote area is we can actually give it a script that says, hey, download this information to the target and then run it. Well, if we can, we want to avoid that for two reasons. One, because we put that, we, we don't want to potentially erase any type of evidence because we've written over it. And two, and this is probably the most more important reason is it takes time. This is just slowing the whole process down. If I have all these machines who have to first download data and then um, execute it. So one of the issues that we run into when we're trying to do this is the fact that we have what is referred to as a double hop. Basically what, what that means is, is that the diagram may make this easier, is it? I have computer A and it's initiating a command to computer B. And then computer B tries to initiate another command to another remote system. And where this comes into play in trying to use PowerShell to do the CAPE uh, remote collections is basically, so A is gonna log into B, no problem. Now B needs to write this data or even read the data so it can execute CAPE from a UNC path. Well, connecting to that UNC path requires another set of authorizations, and PowerShell sees that as another connection in this double hop. There are ways around this. Um, there's a couple of different techniques. We can set um, a PS session configuration, and once that is set up ahead of time, I can use that to connect to each of these machines in sequence. Another way, which some may say has a security issue, is I can basically pass these credentials inside the invoke command script on down the line. Okay, so if we install it locally, um, basically what we need to understand is that all the systems are gonna get this command at the same time, but they still need to be able to run independently because they're not gonna all execute at the same time. So when we look at this next script, what we're gonna see is basically um, CAPE is going to uh, create a directory. It's going to download CAPE. Um, well, the script is gonna create the directory. It's going to tell the system to download CAPE from some source. You know, it could be HTTP, um, it could be uh, ST, FSTP or one of the cloud servers. It then extracts CAPE and then it runs it. And so when it runs it, all it does is initiate CAPE. In that download, there will already be a batch file which tells it what we want to do. Um, so if we're gonna take this approach, one of the things that we need to, to uh, be cognizant of is the fact that we're gonna have to download this data. So let's make it as small as possible. Um, so we're gonna make our own custom distribution, if you will, of CAPE. Um, minimize everything. So one of the first things we wanna do is, take, as an example, take out GCAPE, because it's really big. So we're gonna take out all of the unnecessary uh, elements of a CAPE distribution if they're not used. So if I'm not using a particular set of modules and they're associated binaries, let's take them out. In this one example, um, on the left is basically a full blown installation of CAPE. And on the right is a minimal one that I was using in these particular exercises. And you can see it's considerably smaller. Now, it may not seem like that much, uh, it, you know, in terms of megabytes, but when you multiply that by, you know, 100 systems, 10,000 systems, it starts to make a difference. So we have a bunch of uh, different scenarios that we want to talk through. So number one is CAPE already exists on the system. So all I really need to do is to execute it, okay? Now, if I want to collect a different set of data, then I need to use, uh, I need to get that new batch file to it. So I need to get a cape underscore dot CLI to that system. And the, the command is simple enough. The first thing that we do in PowerShell is we'll create a session. <clears throat> and using that session, 
I will then send this particular command out to um, a set of jobs. So this session basically says, go get, go get the list of computers that is in this text file. And I wanna set up a session to each one of those computers and then run this particular command against that list. So that's one way to do it. Um, next way is that these systems don't have CAPE on it and need to get it there. So the same approach is that I create the session based on the number, the list of computers. Um, I use the invoke command against all of those sessions. And I basically tell it, create the, create the directory, download the file, unzip the file, and then run it. In this particular case, I'm running it with, um, I'm giving this job a name. That's what this last part is. So this particular job, start job here, I'm giving it the same as Cape Collect. Uh, this is what I just talked through, which basically tells us that, you know, hey, here are the, here are the things that are happening in that particular script. Now, Cake needs to be run from a different system. And this is the double hop issue. And this is what we're trying to get over. Um, there is a way to do it. I haven't put it all together yet, but this is where we ultimately want to get to, is the fact that um, I want to be able to, to make my way through that double hop so that I can tell Cape to run from some other path, some other UNC path. And the benefit of that is that I now don't have to download that data to other systems. And if I want to change the batch file, which tells me the configuration of what I want to collect um, and process, I only have to do it in one location. Or if we're talking about in scale, I mean like really big scale, maybe there's four or five different servers that have this data on them that I have to manage versus trying to get that data down to every single system. I said, this is where we this is where we want to want to finally get to. Um, and that script would look like this. It would be so simple. Basically, we set um, we set up our sessions and we just tell it to run Cape and we're running Cape from, you know, some UNC path. Um, so this is ultimately where we want to go. If we get to that, where all of the work comes into is defining those batch files, defining this is exactly what I want to collect. This is exactly what I want to process. Okay, um, Carol, I think I'll kick it back over to you, see if there's any questions or comments. I know that we're running extremely short on time. Yeah, yeah, I'll jump in and get started. There's quite a few. Um, yeah. And I, I was giving people, you know, if we don't get to the question, to all the questions, um, it looks like they can send them directly to you. Uh, oh, you've got yeah. your contact information there. Okay. I had, uh, you know, put in the com in the chat page, they could send it to Q at sans.org, but it's probably better to just <laughs> directly send it to you. All right, yeah, so, so yeah. okay. Is using the VHDX option the best practice or recommended? I use CAPE a lot, but have never tried the VHDX option. Um, it depends on what you're trying to do, right? So if you want to run it and immediately take a look at that data, leaving it in its natural structured form and not zipping it up may be the quickest way because if you're looking at it right away, why do I want to zip it up and then have to unzip it before I can get access to it? But if I need to send that data somewhere else, zipping it up in this nice little container makes a lot of sense. And that's, you know, when we talk about at scale, that's what we're doing. It's like we're, we're, we're running, we're collecting data, we're processing it, we're zipping it all up and sending it to some other place where we're going to do our analysis. All right, thanks. Is there a scenario where you could run CAPE against all or some subset endpoints on a daily basis, then compare deltas as part of identifying suspicious files or keys? Or would there be too many changes to make it useful? Well, that's a really great question and idea. Um, I really have already, when, when we're putting together the presentations, one, I wanted, one thing I wanted to talk about was doing exactly that, is scheduling these jobs to run. So, it makes sense if we're if if our targets are very limited, meaning maybe we want to go out and grab just the registry files, and I bring those registry files back, and I'm looking for something, you know, uh, I don't know, you know, it's uh, let's let's say we we suspect we have malware, and that malware is stored in the registry, and it's base64 encoded, and we know it's going to be really big, right? So I could go, I could create a query 
that says, go find that kind of stuff. And by the way, you could write that query with another one of Eric's tools called um, the, basically the command line version of Registry Explorer. Now, the, the part about comparing the deltas, I'd have to give that some thought. All right, thanks. We'll squeeze one more in. Um, will running Cape from a UNC path allow it to copy locked files? Um, yes, I'm not sure. I'm not sure where that question is coming from. I bet there's some more to that, um, but absolutely. I mean, it can. You know, once it has the privileges, the authority to run that command, it has the full capability of Cape. So what Cape is doing is, it, it first it checks to see if it's locked. If it's locked, it puts it in a list and it makes a second pass for all those locked files and basically totally bypasses the file system and the Windows APIs and collects it you know, in a raw fashion. All right, well, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you so much, Mark, for your great presentation, which helps bring this content to the SANS community. To our audience, we greatly appreciate you listening in. For a schedule of all upcoming and archived SANS webcasts, including this one, please visit sans.org forward slash webcasts. Until next time, take care, and we hope to have you back again for the next SANS webcast.